Welcome to today's episode of Financial Fluency. Today I'm super excited to have Denise Duffield Thomas with me. Denise, thank you so much for joining me. Hey Jen, so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, Denise is super, super special to me because I've been following you since I joined B-School, I think in 2012. I read your book pretty early on. And then in October of 2014, I joined your Lucky Bitch Money Bootcamp. Um, so Denise is the founder of Lucky Bitch Money Bootcamp. She's also the author of two fantastic books, which are Lucky Bitch, A Guide for Exceptional Women to Create Outrageous Success and Get Rich, Lucky Bitch, Release Your Money Blocks and Live a First Class Life. So, oh my gosh, I feel like I have so many things to ask you. It's almost overwhelming to think about it. But why don't we start with, with where you're at right now, and then we can kind of work backwards through all the rest. What's going on with you? Sure. Here? What's going on? Well, I think it's what's really cool is every couple of years, I feel like a bit of a transition happening. And I've definitely, I'm definitely in it at the moment. Every couple of years, I question, what am I doing? Who am I serving? Am I on the right path? Am I on the right track? And what do I really want from my life? And that's what's happening for me at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm almost I've past the crest of it, but it usually kicks in around January sometime when I start to go, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing? Am I on the right track of business? But this year it happened a couple months into the year. So that's, that's where I'm at. So what's your thought process when that sort of thing happens? Well, what I do is I get a lot of information from a lot of different sources, but also I think in those times, it's, it's a really good opportunity to go and explore some old stuff as well. So as you know, in, in the money boot camp, whenever anyone has something new that's going on for them money wise, we always go, okay, where, where does this remind you of from your past? Is there anything new you need to clear and release? So what I've been doing the last um, couple of months is I've been working with different, um, experts to help me uncover what it, what those things are and what i usually find is it's never anything new right it's always just finding like tweaks to old stuff so even last week i, I had a session with someone who does um, something called family constellations work and that's to help you look at your past and look at patterns from your past and related to your family and so that was a really eye-opening in itself. And then I had another session with my kinesiologist. So I always recommend someone goes to see a kinesiologist when you're going through transition and to work through some new stuff because my hubby and I are now working together in the business and that's bringing up some, some new things as well. So again, you know, going back and, and seeing what are the root causes of some of the issues that we're, that, what we're dealing, dealing with at the moment and to give myself permission to, to let them go. So um, I'm always, you know, this as well about me from being in the boot camp. You know, I'm always in the trenches of personal development work because it's ongoing. You never get to a stage where work is done and you're like, I'm perfect. Everything's perfect. There's always new stuff to uncover. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I love about being in the boot camp. Um, so just for people who are listening, a fair part of my audience is probably special needs moms, moms working from home who may not be totally familiar with things like um, kinesthesiology and some of the more woo-woo stuff we talk about in there. But one thing I want to bring up is when I first encountered your stuff, I was a pretty big skeptic. I have a past of like really extreme woo-woo-ness. I was raised in a cult. And when I got out, I really firmly rejected it all. I refused to even meditate for many, many years. So when I approached your stuff, I was like, Oh, that's kind of, you know, and I saw you in, in B school and everything. I was like, that's interesting. And then I like reading books. So when your book, you announced your book in there at one point, and I was like, let me look at that. I love the, I'm probably going to say this wrong, the ho ho pono. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ho po pono. Yeah. Yeah, that was probably the yeah. first like meditative type thing I'd done in a really long time because I was very sensitive about all of that. And I loved it. I imagine. That kind of did some wonders for me when I was reading the book. And then when I did finally join the boot camp, one of my favorite things was that I think it helps if you really believe in a lot of it, but I did not really believe in a lot of it. I was like, oh, this manifestation stuff, uh, I don't know. But I went through the actions and I still got results, even though I was not firmly convinced to start with. So that was a real eye opener for me. I was like, okay, so I'll 
declutter? Like how can decluttering my house and my wallet and my purse and how can buying pretty underwear, <laughs> like how can these things actually have an effect on whether or not people pay me for stuff? Can you talk about, about some of that, like these, these tactics and these exercises that you have us do in the boot camp, and all of which are in the book as well. Like another thing that I've loved about you so much is so much of what's in the boot camp is also in the books. So that if people can't afford the boot camp, if they want the self study experience, or if like me, they're a skeptic, they can do that first. And then if they yeah. want more and want the community and want access to you, then they can, you know, go for the higher price things, but you have, you really give the information to everybody who wants it. And that's such a beautiful way to, to structure your business. Well, let me talk about the woo woo and the skeptic stuff, because I totally, I, I share that skepticism in a lot of ways. Um, and the reason why it does work, even if you just go for it and you sort of go, I don't know if I a hundred percent believe this, but I'm just going to go forward in it anyway. So every exercise that we do, there's a basis in, in science as well, but you can take it however you want to take it. So for the people who are more woo-woo, they can do it from the woo-woo side. And the people who are a little bit more kind of skeptical, it works because usually it's based on like a brain training exercise, for example. So if you don't like the woo-woo words, you can just think I'm training my brain, awareness training like for example, athletes do, like Olympic athletes do visualization exercises because it's been shown to train your brain that then helps you uh, take the action in the, in the real world. So there's scientific basis behind some of the kind of seemingly woo-woo or weird stuff that we do. And um, the other thing is that the placebo effect is a very well-known scientific phenomenon. So that's why when people say to me, well, I don't know if I 100% believe it. I go, doesn't matter. Just try it and do it anyway because sometimes your brain does not know the difference. And sometimes just going forward anyway has a measurable impact on your life. So sometimes when I'm feeling skeptical in myself, I just go, placebo effect. Let's just do it. You know, it'll, it'll work anyway. Where I think it gets tricky is when someone's not even willing to try I'm willing to step forward in any type of faith because inaction just leads to more inaction. Um, but if you just go forward and just try a little bit, not even try and be perfect with it, you will see results because your, your brain will start to think differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I love so much about your way of tackling this is you kind of bring people into it with the idea of, okay, you can manifest money, you can manifest things, you can manifest the life that you want. You can manifest winning a um, round the world six month, like over and over <laughs> uh, contest, which that was an amazing story. But um, when you actually get into the exercises, almost all of them have an action element. So it's almost like bringing people in through this idea of like, we're going to visualize things. We're going to you know have affirmations. We're going to do all this sort of woo woo stuff. But then Especially, um, I remember doing the Do It Quick Lucky Bitch 10-day uh, program and the part where it got to, okay, now write the article or send the pitch or, you know, turn in your application or, you know, do the thing that has the most direct, um, the most direct path to you getting what you want. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, of course I'm going to do this. Like, okay, yeah, okay. I've done, I've like sat here and thought about it and I've visualized and I've written my, my journaling and I've done all this stuff and I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm so in the flow of the idea of it being successful and being done, then I'm just gonna take that action that I've been procrastinating yeah. on. <laughs> so many people though, they try and take the action first without doing any growth work or any mental, emotional work. And that's hard because it is real. Your fear is real and the resistance feels real and procrastination feels real. And if you, you know, sit there and beat yourself up about it. Oh, I can't take action on what I need to do. Then you're really internalizing all that stuff and you're not giving yourself permission to, wow, there must be a root cause as to why I'm procrastinating or why I can't take action. So that's why you have to do the personal growth work first. But the action is super important. And some people do it the other side. They do all of the woo woo stuff or they do all of the nice fuzzy stuff and then they, they go, well, the universe is just going to bring it to me without me having to do anything. That's what manifesting is. Whereas I always say to people, no, manifesting just means to make real. 
to make real. And so anything that you can do to contribute to that, meet the universe halfway, you have to play your part and you can play your part. It's not cheating by taking the action. You're just meeting the universe halfway. And that's when from the outside, it starts to look like that you're really lucky, but you know you're not because you co-created it with the universe. You know, I want to bring up this the universe part of it too. Because again, as someone who had been raised in a like really weird, wacky religion where lots of like not so nice things happened, yeah. I really shy away from organized religion. And I really have issue with um, thinking of it as a human, especially a man, <laughs> that mm -hmm. controls the world. Like I've never liked that idea. But through, I think your book was one of the first places where I ran into this idea of talking to the universe or there being this, not that there's a single one all powerful being of any kind, but just that there's this sort of energetic order to, to things and that you can interact with it and communicate with it. And um, can, can you, ex you explain, you're better at explaining this to me. Well, you know what? I, I'm the same as you. I, well, I didn't grow up in a cult. So, you know, I, I totally understand where you're coming from on that, that point of view, but I really felt really uncomfortable around organized religion my whole life because it felt like that I wasn't good enough, like, or I wasn't being a good girl. Cause there's obviously a lot of that in religion. And so then that tied up for me around, oh, I have to be really good to be deserving of things that come into my life. I have to be a good girl to, to even have money or to other things. So I, I'm, I'm totally get what you're saying about, you know, I don't think that there's this man in the sky who's looking down and going, Jen, all right, you deserve it today. Denise, no, you've been a bad girl. You can't have it. Um, but I don't, I think the struggle with when you're on the other side of it and you're a, a spiritual person is that we don't have a book. We don't have the book. And so it's really easy, you know, if, you're, if you are, religious to sometimes have a very black and white conviction that you are right because you have a, you literally have a book <laughs> and, um, and we don't, we don't have a book. So I, I don't think that I have a black and white view on spirituality or what the universe is either, you know, and I'm not an expert in that, but I think a lot of us who are a bit more spiritually inclined, we feel that there is some, there is an order to the universe and that the difference between that and maybe religion is that we feel like we have a little bit more control over it. We feel like we can control our destiny instead of a man like pointing and saying, you can have it today or you can't. Um, and I think a lot of us have experienced that when you're in the flow and it feels like the whole universe is conspiring to help you. A lot of us know what that feels like. We also know what it feels like to feel like the opposite is true. The, the universe is conspiring against us and, and things aren't going our way. The difference is when you are in a positive frame of mind, I suppose, and then you take positive actions, you can sometimes see that there is a positive consequence that happens from that. And it's a spiral effect, you know, and those little things add up to, to leading a good life. And the opposite is true as well. When we're thinking negative thoughts, we tend to not take action or we take the wrong action. And that spirals and, and creates our reality as well. So I don't know. I still don't, I'm still figuring it out as well, Jen, I think. Well, I know um, somewhere around the time I started your course, and I think it may have been because of this course, that I do 750words.com, which is basically like morning themes. I do it too. Love it. <laughs> and around October 2014, I'm trying to remember if it was inspired directly by something you said or if it was something nearby, but um, I started doing, starting every morning, my morning pages with, uh, I'd say like, good morning Monday and good morning big you. And I started talking to the big you. Um, I'm not talking to God. I'm not, I don't even call it universe. That seems too formal, but it's just like my little bit that revolves around me. Like, okay, here's what's going on. I'd kind of rant to it or make my mm -hmm. to-do or whatever but it kind of gave me this little touchstone of like trying to think a little bigger a little beyond just myself of like okay this is what I see happening right now and being open to a response of some kind again I've never had any voice talk to me or anything like that but um but like you said seeing looking for positive things and and finding them um you know it's kind of like that thing you read about where they say um okay 
think of a color red and suddenly like every red thing in your field it pops out at you or or if you really want a bmw and you're driving down the street and you see every bmw they were always there but you didn't notice before right so i kind of feel like that's been one of the effects for me and it made me realize that even if the result isn't directly monetary i'm happier <laughs> like i'm happier thinking this way than i was not thinking that way and you know what it's great that you said that because i think what's happened in the world is that we've been taught that money is this thing that um uh, more is is better necessary you know more is better but what I, where i think we're getting to now is we're realizing that money is just a tool for us to live the life that we want to live and there aren't any rules anymore you know you've got people who are millionaires who choose to live in a tiny house like a, literally a house that's the size of one room and you know there aren't any rules to what makes us happy and that's what money is a tool to do is to make us happy and to help us change the world it's not to buy more stuff that's not the that's not the that's not the goal at all and you know when when i talk about being rich sometimes it triggers people because they think being rich means one thing like you have to dress in a certain way or have to be a certain way and i really truly do mean richness in all areas but including money because some people will just think oh well money is not a thing like money is not going to make me happy and it's like well it, it can it can contribute to it but it's only one aspect of happiness and it's we don't all need to earn the same to feel safe and secure and happy we can totally choose which is the most beautiful thing but the trickiest thing for women because we haven't been taught to choose powerfully we we in some cases we've never even had the choice to decide what we want to do for work or for a play or where we want to live it's being decided for us by other people now is the time for us it's and it can be confronting for us you know sometimes you even say to people well, what do you want to eat you know and some women i've been out to dinner with some women and they're looking at the menu and they can't even choose they can't even decide what they actually want to eat because they're so uh, that muscle for them is so underused they're so used to being told what they can and, and can't do and really richness is also about discernment deciding what you what you want and that's that's trickier than we've ever thought it could be because most of us have never had that luxury of choice i remember when i was dating and just after college going out with a guy who always wanted to know where i wanted to eat and i always did the i don't know what do you want i don't know where do you want to go and it annoyed him mm -hmm. so much that he was like i'm not picking anymore like we're only going places you choose and it was it was such a nice thing for him to do to make me recognize like oh wow i mean of course if he wasn't here if i was just driving down the street and thought where do i want to eat on my own i would pick a place and yet i was deferring to someone else's preference so much and i think we are taught that a lot as yeah. like women caregivers nurturers to defer well, look how many women go into a store and before they even look and see what they want, they'll look at the price tag to see if they're allowed to even want it. So I always say to people, okay, you know, let's look at price tags, go and see what you like first. And that's not to say that if the dress was $20,000, you're like, well, I told Denise I was going to buy it regardless, but it's more about giving you, giving yourself permission to like what you like. You might even decide that the dress is cheaper than you thought it was going to be, or it might be slightly more expensive, but it's using that choice muscle. And um, there's real richness in that, in deciding who you want to be, not how much money you want to make. I'm having one of those moms working from home moments. Yes. Oh, please. hi. <laughs> That's the Hi. Name. <laughs> Sorry, Denise. No. That, if you just push there, it'll make it play, okay? Go give it a try. Ask Dad. Okay, hit the menu button. The menu will bring it back to Netflix. If that's what you no, it's already on the menu. Okay. You know what? I need Daddy to go help you for a little bit. He but can do it. But he doesn't know how to use it. Daddy can use the TV. No, I need this. Oh, TV. Hit menu a couple of times. It'll clear it, and then you can scroll up and down. I tried it. Do you want to go in? Do you want to go in quickly? Do I it? I promise you guys can figure it out. Okay. Let Daddy help you. 
Okay, well, have him pick up the sofa and find the silver one. I bet the dog pushed it under. Okay. I totally get it. <laughs> How old is she, by the way? Seven. <laughs> oh my God, she's adorable. So, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about the way that women and men handle things like this too, because did you see that viral video that went on TV where there's this man who's in, it looks like an office and he's giving his report on the news on television and a child comes in and um, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny because a lot of people posted like, oh, that's so cute. The kid came in. I was really kind of offended because he took the kid and pushed him by the face, like trying to get him out of the screen. And then the mom comes in and crawls on the floor with a baby, like tr obviously desperate to fix the situation for the husband. And I was like, it would have been cool if he just picked the kid up, put him on his lap, and was like finished his report. I mean, it went viral anyway, so I was like, I would have loved if it, if it had just, you know, we took a moment to acknowledge the existence of the child and then go on. So, absolutely. So anyway. And, but that's part of it, right? Is that that's our life. You know, it's work and it's play and it's, it's all of that stuff can combine. And I think we're getting to that point now where so many women are seeing like who am I all together not who am I at work and who am I in business and who am I at home we're trying to bring all those pieces of us together and um we're getting there as women I'm sleepy yeah I know you're sleepy <laughs> okay we're having Hi a guys. Podcast so normally I do have child care if I book uh, a podcast in the evening <laughs> But with it being Mother's Day weekend, <laughs> can you pull the door shut, please? With it being Mother's Day weekend, our, um, our your audience is going to love this, by the way. <laughs> They're going to love it. Um, my two are out of the house, but I totally get it. And it, it, that's what happens these days, you know? And it's like, it's brilliant. I remember periscoping and you had Willow right there. And I was like, Willow, hi. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I think women, re we really need to be okay with all of those bits of our, our life coming together. And, you know, especially for mums, like the, there's such a big money lesson for mums in not trying to compartmentalise our life because our kids are watching. You know, people ask me this all the time, what should I teach my kids about money? And I said, you don't have to teach them anything. You just have to work on yourself because that's what they're going to learn from more than anything else they're really not going to listen to like if you sit down and try and like okay I want to teach you a lesson about money but they're going to watch how you treat yourself they're going to watch how you work and how you talk about your work you talk about what you love and in your energy around money they're learning from that more than anything else so I just say to people like don't worry about it like don't worry about trying to sit down and try to do anything just just work on yourself the, the one part that I worry about is one of the exercises you had us do, which I'm going to share because okay. I always like to have a few takeaways that they can go ahead and try to you know, get some results and see what you're talking about. So one of the ones that was struck me so much when we started was the money stories exercise. Do you mind yeah. if we share that one? Sure. Absolutely. Because I remember when I started, I was like, okay, money stories. Let, let me, let me get out a nice big legal pad. I wrote, I think it was 13 pages. <laughs> Wow. Uh, yeah. because my parents yeah. had gone through five divorces between the two of them and when I thought back I just had so many memories that impacted the way that I think about and interact with money and men and other women and family members so so many things and I was shocked that I had that much but once I started a real flow started you know I got into flow state as I was just like spouting them out and then when I went through the money boot camp again a few years later you know every now and then within the group someone will be like I'm gonna redo it or when you run it live again mm. I'll try it and I still had other ones that I hadn't hit that first time mm. um, so d would you tell the audience what what you have us do with the money yeah so it's one of yeah it's one of the first exercises that we get, do we do in the boot camp and we go through everything that you can remember about money and there's a ton of prompts in there about you know what about this what about this what about this just to you know prompt some of those things but the truth is how we are about money it, it didn't come from nowhere you know it's come from experiences we've had and of course there's you know we have our own unique money personality you can grow up exactly the same as someone else in your family and still have different views on money and that's that's one part of it 
<laughs> Absolutely. But generally, you know, our attitudes around money have come from a few different places. Um, parents, grandparents, like, you know, immediate family, school, teachers, um, friends, but also really subtle things. Like you could have the same amount of money as another family, but if you grew up in a completely different town, you might feel poor in one town and rich in another town. So all of those things are so nuanced. And I always thought it was really black and white because I grew up with a single mom um, and we didn't have a lot of money. So I just assumed, well, if you have money, your life must have been perfect growing up and you'd have no hang-ups around money. So I honestly thought that money blocks was a poverty thing. I really did. Now that I've worked that with so many women through books and my courses, I realize that has got nothing to do with it because your perception of the circumstance or the way that your parents dealt with the circumstance, that's the stuff that affects you more than anything else. So you could have money blocks from growing up in a family that had a ton of money. And that really surprised me too. So each of us have such unique stories that that's where it's a really great place to start to think about any strong memory that you had around money or any shaming experience or negative experience or something that someone told you and you will see patterns you'll start to see patterns emerge about why you act the way you act with money now and that's awareness is going to be the first stage to to seeing where those patterns lie and to see where your sabotages might be because some people um, follow the same patterns and some people rebel against them, but often we swing too far and we, then we create our own problems as well. So um, yeah, there's some real juice in that and some real gold. And incidentally, I think whatever goal you have in your life, say for example, you want to manifest a soulmate, that exercise is still really important. Go back and look at what your parents said about love and relationships and what they taught you about marriage. So it really works for anything is just to go and like dig that gold. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have us write them down, right? Like, yeah, did my sheets on legal pages, and mm -hmm. then, and then, what do you have them do? So the next stage is to look for patterns. So it could be that you um, see recurring things over and over again, and see what sabotages might have come from that. Um, and then we do a whole bunch of forgiveness, and this is the key. This is the key to creating your own foundation. Otherwise, you were just building it on a mountain of trash you're building your beautiful house on a mountain of trash so that's why you've got to dig through that and you've got to forgive it and sometimes you've got to examine some of those things and you know feel the feelings and forgive it anyway forgive the people involved so each one of those things just builds a little layer out of the trash and so you can then build build your new house on a strong foundation everyone resists this by the way no one thinks that it applies to them everyone thinks that they can just push through and not have to do the forgiveness work and not have to go there because they think like i'm over it or you know well what happened to me is really bad i can't forgive or whatever there's people have got their own unique excuses i've heard them all for sure but really this is the path to not even even having to like dig through the trash but it melts some of it away like it melts it and um, you might not be realizing that you're living with that stuff in you, but you are, you know, and you could be living that every day. So it's, it's getting rid of all that emotional energy, getting rid of all that um, unnecessary stuff that you're holding on to. So you can create something new from it. So uh, do you mind walking them through the for forgiveness part of it? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I remember a couple of years ago reading about forgiveness on Oprah dot com because all of my life I've been influenced by Oprah and she talked about how forgiveness can create amazing things for you it can it's the gift that you give yourself truly not the gift that you give other people so I started reading a lot more about forgiveness and that's when I heard about Ho'oponopono which is a forgiveness ritual um, a Hawaiian forgiveness ritual that can really create miracles and so if anyone's interested you can go read books about Ho'oponopono um, but it's, it's basically a four stage process and I always get the order mixed up and it really doesn't matter. So please people don't email me saying that the order is wrong and then therefore it does not work. It totally works. So say for example, you, there's a specific incident that you remember or a specific person that you know is clouding your relationship with money right now. And this is where the gift is for you because you think, well, I'm not going to forgive that person. 
it's like, well, you know what, this, this gift is really for you because you want to release it from you holding this anymore. So you say to that person or situation, I forgive you. And then thank you. And people hate this part, right? Because it's like, why should I thank someone for a shitty gift that they gave me? But the truth is all of those all of those things have led you to where you are today and have maybe created some, um, maybe you've gone down a different path because of that situation. Either way, there is always some gift, some hidden gift in there. Even if you think, no, that was a terrible experience, deep down there, there is some hidden gift there for you. Um, so that's where you, you say thank you. And then you also say, please forgive me. And this triggers people so much too and they do not want to do it. I get it. Mm -hmm. Um, so this isn't victim blaming. This isn't saying that you attracted that situation into your life. Therefore, you know, it's your fault, but it's about, again, releasing. Sometimes the please forgive me is about, um, almost saying to yourself as well, please forgive me for holding this onto this for, for so long and for creating things in my life because of this. So it's not even necessarily to that person because some people you might think it unforgivable and you never, you know, you think, no, they really did do horrible things to me, but it's about from a energetic soul level, releasing it. Like, please forgive me too for my part in holding on to this, not necessarily my part in creating it. And then you always end with, and I love you. And people hate this bit too and <laughs> always resist it because they think, well, why should I love someone who's, who's hurt me? And again, you're not, it's not necessarily that person, but you think it from a soul to soul level, you want to release it from a soul to soul level. You do not have to say this to the person, by the way, you don't have to call them and say, I forgive you because a lot of people in their human experience, they don't know how to deal with that. And they might be in blaming mode or they might still be creating that situation. It might not ever change them ever. And you have to accept that all this is for you to release it in every way possible from your experience. So you don't have to keep on reliving it. You don't have to um, repeat the patterns and you can send love, which is the most powerful force in the universe, send love to it so you can, so you can release it and, and let that go. Then you cross it off from your list and you go on to the next one. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a miracle making exercise. And you, sometimes you have to go forward in faith and, and try it, even if you don't 100% mean it. You have to go forward in faith and try it anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I love you explaining the part about not necessarily forgiving someone who hurt you in their current human form. But like, yeah, because <laughs> I, I did struggle with that. At the same time, so many of my things on my list involved family members that I it did feel right to still say, I love you because I mean, we still have this family connection. I mean, and even people who I'm not directly related to, but influenced in me in this way. Um, most of them, I had a close relationship of some kind with at some point in order for them to have that power to influence me. Um, I wept a lot when I did this. Mm -hmm. I did it at home alone when everyone was gone. And then I think in the end, I took my 13 pages. I think I even took a picture and posted it in the group. I tore them up and burned them at the barbecue <laughs> just to kind of be like, okay, I don't even want that in the trash. I just want it gone. And I didn't want anyone to read it. I didn't want anyone to see it. It was just for me, but it was really, really powerful. Like I felt physically exhausted after I did it. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, it is for you. It's not, um, it's not to give peace to the other person by saying, I forgive you and, you know, I, whatever. Because you don't even have to have a conversation with them at all, as I said. And if you're really struggling with it, something that helps is to imagine that person as a little baby, not in their current, as you said, current human form. Mm -hmm. um, but imagine them as a little baby and it makes it so much easier to have compassion in your heart for whatever they must have gone through to do that to you or to create that to you and realising that... Um, you know, we all start off as innocent babies and, you know, that really, that helped for me to do, to do that rather than to think of that person. Mm -hmm. So another part of um, the boot camp that I loved because it, I felt like it was one of those moments where you almost like tricked someone into doing something really 
mentally effective and efficient anyways, even though they might have resisted it in another setting, was the money tracking, which I think is so important because I think so many women do kind of, oh, we're not taught about money as children. Our parents talk to us differently about money than they do the boys usually. We're not always yep. informed of everything. Um, a lot of people still think that women will get married and get taken care of, which just doesn't happen like it used to. And even when it used to happen, it often wasn't um, a very powerful situation for women to be in. So, you know, just being aware of what comes in and what goes out and the tracking part. I love how you start people just tracking what comes in, including the values of things they're given. Like, can you tell the story about manifesting stuff instead of money and, and the shift that that took? Because I know we're oh, kind of absolutely. Getting, I just I think <clears throat> into because we don't always track everything that comes into our lives and and appreciate it the way we would do it in money into bank. Absolutely. So for the, for me, this came out where I've always been a personal development junkie. I've always read books, gone to seminars, all that stuff, and I meet people like this all the time who are super positive and they are doing the work in a lot of ways they're doing the work that they need to do but their bank accounts are empty <laughs> and it's like they've got nothing to show for it except for the a positive attitude which is wonderful and I find that a lot of those people myself included are, are brilliant at manifesting free stuff or they're brilliant at manifesting what they need to get by and I know someone like this who she doesn't even have a, a home she does house sitting She's incredibly positive and she doesn't have a house because, you know, she's like, doesn't want to deal with money, you know, in a way. And I was kind of the same and I was getting to a point where I was just manifesting crazy amounts of free stuff. Um, I didn't have enough money to pay my tuition for college and it was getting really close to the due date. And I was like, I just feel like it's going to be okay. And I got a bank error in my favor for the amount, like literally three days before my tuition was due. I had no other plan to pay it, by the way. Um, and things like that were happening where I wanted to do a life coaching course and I got a scholarship for a life coaching course. I wanted to write a book. I, got, um, I won a free Lucky Door Prize about publishing your book. So all these things were happening. And then you mentioned it before about um, this, the travel competition. So I wanted to go traveling around the world and Mark and I, we won a honeymoon testing competition where for six months we traveled around the world, stayed in five-star hotels and blogged about the experience for free. So once that happened, this is where I cottoned on to it because I went, oh my God, the universe is helping me, but it's also conspiring with this, this thought that I have where I don't want to touch money. And it's helping me to get all the stuff I want, but, but keeping me helpless in lots of ways, right? Keeping me without having to look at money or having to deal with money. And I was almost like when I was on the honeymoon test competition, I didn't even carry a wallet around with me because we were always, we, we traveled somewhere. We got picked up from the airport. We got taken to a, a hotel. Everything was included. We never had to pay a bill. And then we went somewhere else, which sounds amazing, right? And it was amazing. But obviously it didn't last forever. And at the end of the trip, I was like, I don't have anything in my bank account. I have no money. And I actually said, oh my God, universe, I'm a big girl now. Like, is it okay? Like, instead of getting stuff for free all the time, which is great, can I like experience paying for things myself? And can I experience some actual cash in my bank account? And the message back was sure, but you're going to have to do some work around this. Because as you said, women are not raised to be comfortable with money. We're not raised to be comfortable talking about it, getting it, spending it, saving it, investing it. It's, it's kind of a little bit against our natures as we've been trained to do it. Even to the point where I saw this ad recently, a bank did it, I think it was in Australia, um, where they did a study on pocket money and actually girls get paid less pocket money than boys do. So it starts at such an early age and so it was incredibly uncomfortable for me to even make that ask to the universe where I was like, but I want the experience of paying for stuff and, and making money and being okay to, to actually have this conversation. And then I've noticed that even with women in entrepreneurial communities, they're like, well, let's just barter. Like, let's just exchange services. Let's not have money change hands. And I think that's really wrong for our community because we 
money makes the world go round and it's time for women to be okay with making money, using money as a tool, because the world is going to make a massive shift when we do that. And it's already started, you know, our generation of women, we're really the first generation of women that is, that is expected to work full time. You know, our moms might not necessarily have done that. Our grandparents, our grandmothers, most of us haven't seen that either. And it's our generation. that's like, Oh, what happens? What's going to happen to the world where women harness money, actual money as a tool to do good things in the world. And for me making that decision, things started shifting almost immediately. It was very confronting and I had to deal with a lot of my stuff. Like, you know, we do on the boot camp. and, um, but being friends with money is, is great. You know, when, when you can actually receive money for what you do, we can do amazing things with that women, you know, like women, we can do that. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I did want to talk about the community just real quick, because, um, as much as I love the exercises and everything, the community of the boot camp has been really astounding. And I've not seen this level of member engagement in many other Facebook groups that I've been in. I've been in quite a few. I've been in bigger ones. I've been in bigger paid ones. I've been in, you know, smaller mastermind type ones. But um, what I've been so impressed with is it, it is our place, those of us in it, to come and talk about money. Um, we all post wins. We all post struggles. We all post all kinds of things. Um, and I have, I would just sat here before you came on and I scrolled through my past episodes and I made a quick tally of the number of lucky bitches that I've had on my podcast, because these end up being the women that we have these amazing conversations about money. I learn about them. You know, the show's about money. Uh, I counted up 23, roughly a few people. I was like, are they in the group or are they not? So I didn't put them down, but 23 women, and I, this is probably going to be, I think episode 94, 95. That's a lot, especially considering I do solo episodes too. So I have made some amazing friends and connections through your group. Um, it is a no promo group. So obviously we're not like promoting our services, but we've just, those of us, like I've met several women in there who have special needs kids and we have our own set of financial stuff going on or women sure. who, you know, experienced abuse. There's a lot of extra, like trying to find your agency and all that sort of thing. And um, it's, it's really an incredible group that you formed. And I just wanted to uh, commend you on that. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you. And what was important for me was growing up, I felt like I didn't have any friends who were interested in money and business. I've always been a very entrepreneurial kid. So I was really interested in money and I felt like a black sheep in my family and um, in my friendship groups. So I was really searching for a group like that, you know, and that's, I think that's the reason why I'm, I contribute in that group. I mean, I'm very mindful of the fact that I'm a leader. I, I don't share my stuff in there. You know, I've got my own mastermind groups to work out or that, that for myself, but I, I really genuinely like the energy of the group. And so um, I've deliberately created a space that I like to be in selfishly um, because there's not that many space, safe spaces for women to talk about money and without us, without it, you know, being accused of bragging or being salesy or being, you know, caring too much about money. Um, you know, it's a very caring group and a lot of the stuff that's, that we talk about isn't really about money. Really. If you scratch the surface, it's about giving ourselves permission to be enough and, um, and releasing the fear around money. Yeah. Well, it has been great being in there. I really appreciate it. And I also was impressed with the way when you had a baby, say, you so gracefully were able to step back and everything just kept running right on along. I mean, not, not exactly the same without you, but like the group has mm -hmm. its own energy enough that conversations still happen, things still happen, people still, you know, asked other people, do you want to do the, the do it quick 10 day course with me real quick, the accountability buddies, you know, I could see that um, you've got the, the motion going in there so much that now, I mean, you come in and out and it, it's just, it's kind of its own entity. It is. And that's a real transition that that's happened in the last year. I, I think it was about a year ago that I realized that I was stagnating the size of the group um, because I was holding on to the energy too much and I was, 
almost that, um, not that I was letting it feed off me, but I realized that it does have its own energy and it has to have its own um, space. And I couldn't be like the bottleneck of that, you know, the energetic bottleneck of that. So I made a decision about a year ago to kind of not cut the cords necessarily, but to give birth to it as a separate, um, let it go as a separate entity. And, um, and I, I feel another one come another shift coming around that too, where it's like, I feel like, I, I know this sounds really woo woo, so forgive it, but you know, I think, oh, it really is, it's, it is a separate entity. And I almost feel like sometimes I want to do like space clearing for it and to, you know, like do nice things for it rather that's separate to me. You know, it's not like, oh, I need to do this because it's me. It's like, no, it wants to grow and it wants to do its own thing. <laughs> so um, I'm constantly trying to think of how that can shift and grow especially without my energy because otherwise it will stagnate it because I'll have another baby at some point and I don't want it to be like, oh, when Denise turns away, it dies from, you know, lack of sunshine because it doesn't need, it does not need me. And I've noticed that in groups like B-School, Marie Folio's B-School, Marie physically isn't in that group and it hasn't mattered. And so I'm like, oh, I need to get over the ego thing of like, it's me that people are coming for because they're not. Now they're coming for the connection and the energy of its of its own thing which is amazing and you know I have big I have really big goals for that group because I know that the work is so needed in um for women and so my ego has to stay out of that completely I partially agree with you about the b-school comparison though personally Coming from a time when it was smaller, I wish there was some access. Like, I've loved that we have mm -hmm. some access to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, periscopes, and you comment on people's stuff, and you're in there. You know, usually at least weekly, you ask us what our goals are and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and with B-School, I, I don't know the last time I was in there. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Mainly because it's, it's grown so big, so fast, and it had different groups at different times. I'm not even sure. Yeah. Yeah, even um, people have asked me to create spin-off groups in, you know, in our group and I've always, it's not the right time yet because I want to do it, I want to do it really well if we do that and, you know, I, I've been so grateful for Marie because she's, you know, so, I've been able to see, you know, what, what goes on with big groups like B-School mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it means that I can be a little bit more intentional about it because I can see um, and I think spin-off groups will come for sure when we reach a certain point in, um, in boot camp but you know I'm definitely still learning and growing as a as a leader mm -hmm. and I resisted the role for a long time too um, you were probably in there when it was like anyone could do anything in the group because I was like it's not you know anyone can do anything it's a democracy and then I was like yeah but groups also need containers and they need sacred rules so people know what you know what they can and can't do but I resist that for a long time I really resisted the leadership of it um, so that's been a great lesson I always just say business being business for yourself is such great personal development because you learn all these things you know um, that you can't read in a book and experience you have to be in the trenches Mm -hmm. And just wrapping up, because I know you probably have to go, but one other thing that I've been so impressed with watching you for all these years is the way that you have made this main single course with your books, your thing and work and you've evolved it and you've done different things, but so many of the rest of us, like I have had multiple businesses during the time that you have developed this course and your single course has been so focused and successful and impactful whereas a lot of other people who are like let me let me try this little oh, i don't know and let me try that thing or they record the course and then they never put it out there or you know just so many things it's been great to watch you have such focus and um and staying power with this yes but <laughs> no but and that's great but that's not the full picture and, you know, my first online business was in 2004. It was internet dating tips for men. Didn't have a blog attached to it, but it had an ebook. Then I did Niecy's movie reviews. Then I did Green Detox Clean. Then I did Raw Brides. And then I did my own blog, Denise Duffield Thomas. But I was talking about like 10 different topics. I was talking about manifesting your soulmate and um, 
getting a raise at work and all this kind of stuff. So the full picture is I did the exact same thing as everyone, like that a lot of people do. You just saw it when I was, when a lot of things were coming together for me and when I decided to, to really focus on money. So um, I think that's a normal, normal path to go through where you're like, huh, because you, you're throwing things out and seeing what works, but also seeing what you like. It's that whole discernment thing, right? It's like, am I good at this? Am I good at this? What um, really makes the difference is you give yourself permission to do the things that you really like and that you're really good at. This is what made the difference for me and to let go of the rest. And whereas some people never get to that place of permission um, or they think that in the experimentation itself, there's something wrong with them. And that, that's just part of being in business. I think everyone has practiced businesses but at some point, you know, it's, it's okay to go, Hey, this is what I'm really good at. And other stuff is a distraction. I got distracted. Um, when I wrote my soulmate book, you know, get hitched, lucky bitch. <laughs> and that was, that was my soulmate book. And I, I wrote it. I got it edited. I got a cover design for it. I invested maybe about $5,000 into that book. And I canned it at the last minute because I realized what I was doing. I was trying to be everything to everyone and trying to solve every problem of the world for, for my clients. And then I just went, you know what, One, I'm just going to do the money stuff. I'm just going to be good at that. And I don't have to be everything to everyone. Um, and I still struggle with that. I still sometimes do things that I think, oh, that's not quite, that's not quite right. Or that's not quite most genius. And, you know, I'm just still, you know, in that space of, am I allowed to just do the things that I like? Okay, cool. Can I outsource the rest? It's a pretty normal journey, I think. So, well, and I love that you're so transparent with all of us about those things you just told me right now because I didn't know most of those. But I do remember you writing an email about um, the product lines and the app. You know, you had this time of experimenting with like the fabric in your background with the bees on it. And um, I do, mm. I was one of the people who bought the Lucky Bee ring. Yeah. <laughs> My two good <laughs> podcasts both have as well. So every now and then we're like, Wonder Twins, woohoo. <laughs> oh my God. Um, can, you, can you just give me one sec? I'll go get my cushion. Wait one sec. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I, this happens still. I get, I get distracted or I think it's something's a good idea. I got cushion made in my brand fabric. This is just one of the many things I have in my house, by the way, that is um, branded, including a swimsuit. <laughs> That's really ugly and hideous. Um, and I'm still going through, I think this is this next transition for me. It's like, how else can I live my life on purpose and doing things that I really love and letting go of the rest? And that can be really hard because sometimes things come at us because other people have told us we should or um, people sometimes your clients ask for something and you don't have the heart to tell them no. So it's, again, it's that, that thing about discernment, right? That we're, um, we have to build that muscle of asking ourselves what we want, mm -hmm. not what other people want. And it's really great. We're talking now because we've just had mother's day and you know, that's, it's so symbolic, isn't it? As, as mothers, especially, we're not used to going, hang on, what do I want? And am I allowed to have that with, without guilt? And that's all we're, what we're here for. Just keep on experimenting and don't be hard on yourself and just keep on asking, what do I want? What do I want? And give yourself permission to have it. I think that is a really perfect place to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. so, I'm so happy that we figured out the time zones and got this scheduled in and it worked out. Um, is there anything that you have coming up this summer that you want to share? Yes. Well, when are we going live with this? What date are we going live roughly? Cause I've got tons of stuff, but I don't want to tell anything that's too old or too. <laughs> Probably about two weeks. Again, um, like I was telling you just before we hit record, we were trying to figure out, Oh wait, my, my assistant sent the link to her assistant, but it's, you know, nighttime here and it's early morning there and our assistants aren't on. <laughs> Connect with each other. So I think it's probably in about two weeks, um, but we can adjust the schedule when, you know, if you have a launch or something coming up. Perfect. Well, we're actually launching something brand new in June. Oh. I know it's so great. And I'm sure Jen, um, you're an affiliate partner of ours, so you can have all the links below. Um, we're launching a money archetypes course that um, I'm certified in. 
uh, so it's, it's not my original work, but it's a course that I really passionately believe in. And so I went and got certified in teaching the methodology and it's about finding your unique personality when it comes to money and how you can really utilize your gifts as well as learning about your challenges around money. So what I do in my money boot camp, which we also have a live launch coming up for that in August um, I help people really look at the, you know, the past stuff and the sabotages and really what is around your, your money stuff and looking at your money blocks. This course is slightly different and they're very, they're very separate courses. This one is really about finding what your gifts are around money and your real unique money personality. Cause as I said, you could grow up the same way as someone else in the same family and have completely different money blocks. And this is what this kind of piece is, is to find out your unique money um, DNA, so to speak. So Jen, I'm sure we'll, um, we'll do a link. Um, we've got a quiz, we can, a free quiz where you can find out your money personality and get the first part of the training for free, uh, which is fascinating stuff. And as I said to you before, I love personality tests. I love finding out more about myself. And so doing the course has been really transfer transformational for me. And I'm super excited to bring it out to, to my audience. Can I ask um, whose course it is? Because I did a money like archetypes quiz a while ago and I'm like, is this who I think it is? Kendall Summerhawk. Is that who you think it is? No, I was Yes. Yes. Yeah, thinking... So I love Kendall's money work. She's been a great influence on me. I love that she has amazing boundaries. She's a very strong, powerful woman. Um, and I actually did this certification a couple of years ago and I did nothing with it. I, because I didn't want it to be a distraction, you know, I was creating my own money course at the time and I wanted to make sure that I was very strong in my own work. Mm. Um, but I've been privately teaching it on retreats for a couple of years. So if you've been on a retreat with me, anyone listening, um, you, you'll be familiar with, with the work and it was time to bring it out to the wider audience. It was time to bring it to, to my lucky bees around the world. Cause I think it's really powerful. It's, it's not going to be an ongoing piece of work for us. Like our, you know, money bootcamp is going to be our ongoing evergreen program, but I think once or twice a year, I think it will we'll bring it out. So, you know, when this goes live, we're probably live with the launch. So you can, um, Jen will post the link below for you to take the quiz and to get the free first part of the training. And, um, I'll be reading comments and, and seeing how people like the course. Cause I, I know people are going to love it. Oh, that's exciting. I can't wait. So it's going to be a good summer. So um, yes. yeah, I think I'll be seeing more of you and all of this stuff then, Denise. And thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jen. It's been a really juicy conversation and um, I'd love to hear from anyone who's got any ahas. You can tag Instagram is a great place to tell me your ahas. My handle is at Denise DT. Okay, great. We'll put that link in there as well. So thank you again, Denise, and have a great day in Australia. I'll see you. Thanks, Jen. Bye. Bye.